terms of content and action for the future, uh, WWF and Club of Rome, as I said earlier this morning, are relatives. And some of your members are our members also, and some of our members are your members. And I hope that uh, this cooperation and the joint venture uh, will be the starting point of uh, more cooperation and joining uh, uh, each other's efforts uh, to have a bigger impact uh, in changing the world for a better. Yesterday evening, um, between, or this morning, between 12 and 1, I was in bed and um, uh, looking at the election results in Greece, France, northern Germany, and um, these were another three governments wiped out on one day after the majority of European governments now having been wiped out over the last 12 months at a uh, high-speed process which we have never experienced in the past. And then I looked at my iPad version of your book, Jürgen, and I wanted to read a few more pages again. And I said to myself, how can one be so courageous to write a book about 2052 if at this point of time in our life changes are so fast that we have no solid foundation from which to plan or to extrapolate and at this high-speed internet time of changes we live in, who knows what is happening in 20 years, 30 years, are the demographic uh, extrapolations correct? Uh, will there be peace? Will there be employment uh, beyond climate change? So, um, first of all, I want to congratulate you that you had the courage to undertake this. Um, you are um, a standalone um, tower uh, of uh, courage in this respect because there's no other book. Uh, around uh, since several or since many years with this kind of projection. Um, and this uh, deserves a particular um, support and appreciation uh, because uh, the questions you are asking uh, create a platform for dialogue on a level far beyond and above climate change. Uh, when I started to read your book, I was first concerned that this would only a, would be about climate change. However, in the title of your book, you don't talk about climate change. It's uh, a forecast for 2052, and the word climate change is not part of the title. Um, but you use the climate change issue and problems as a starting point for a broader projection. And that is truly in the spirit of uh, the Club of Rome methodology of an holistic, general, transdisciplinary approach in terms of global and long term. And uh, this is uh, really in the true sense of the old uh, 1972 version of uh, the limits to growth, uh, which also took this broader approach correct in content, wrong sometimes in timing, but what, what does timing mean in a world of billions of years? If we are 10 years or 20 years or 30 years out, it's, it's irrelevant. Um, if you say uh, the end of the world is tomorrow, Yolanda, I say, well, the future starts today. Um, and uh, whether this future in our projection ends in 30, 40, 50 or 100 years doesn't make a difference as long as we have an impact of people's information, attitude and actions from today on. And this is the hope and this is uh, the thrust uh, which is uh, represented by this book. Um, now, a few um, comments on, on form and content. Um, you call it a forecast. I'm not so sure that that is the ideal word, um, because 
in the text itself, you talk about an educated guess, um, which I like much more. Um, a forecast gives the impression that uh, this is somehow solid scientifically based, which of course it cannot be by definition. And um, in the original um, uh, book, uh, Limits to Growth, uh, uh, of which you were an author, and there's another co-author here in the room, which is a very special event. Uh, I'm glad to see you here. Um, the fact that uh, uh, they talked about scenarios or um, alternatives described it a bit better. And again and again, uh, the media are quoting the limits to growth as a forecast, which it hasn't been. So I think you have to protect yourself a bit together with us that you are not um, tied to a forecast which is really the best of educated guess available. So that's um, one comment. Second comment, on more on form and editorial. Um, I have the habit of when I have to read a book, uh, to form an opinion about a book, I read it late in the evening, uh, normally in bed, and I check how fast I fall asleep. Uh, my average survival time uh, between uh, 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock in the morning is some 30 minutes. Uh, then I definitely fall asleep. In your case, I did not fall asleep. I, I kept reading for an hour and I knew I'm going to continue the next day. So it's what you said, readable. Uh, this is very important because if, if you want to write something for the bookshelves, that's one thing as a professor of a Norwegian uh, university. But if you want to have impact on a global scale, it has to be juicy and readable. And that you have achieved. Congratulations. Um, the sentences are clear. They're mainly short. Uh, it's uh, a lot of um, headlines in between, some quick summaries, and these glimpses, of, as you call them, um, very refreshing different opinions on particular issues. This is... Uh, a nice art of work for communication also, and uh, sets an example for many other books which are largely unreadable and have no impact at all. So this book has the chance of having impact, and uh, I could see from the interviews uh, I gave uh, concerning uh, and referring to this book that there was a growing appetite by journalists on this because they understand this, uh, it's new for them, and, uh, and what is more important for me, and this is my, my first comment on content, is that you really are addressing issues uh, in terms of uh, the political uh, global governance situation today, as well as uh, the state of, uh, of Western capitalism. And um, when we move away from Europe and North America more to Asia, where uh, the change of power uh, takes place and uh, where the gravity of our world is moving at this point of time. Um, when I am on behalf of the Club of Rome talking to leaders in, in those countries, particularly India, Indonesia, and probably next uh, two weeks in China also, um, they have now watched for several decades our democracies and our Western market economy or Western form of social market economy or capitalism. And their big concern is not to repeat the mistakes we made. They know there's something wrong in this, otherwise we wouldn't have come there where we are at this moment uh, with the debt, uh, debts in the States uh, with the Euro crisis in the periphery of the European Union and also the European Union integration crisis which we have. So um, this discussion on democracy and on revising our Western um, economic system in the East is already underway and it's slowly spreading uh, to the West also. And um, what you uh, label as uh, short-termness uh, 
is more than that. It is something which does not get uh, the support by the electorate anymore. Uh, the latest surveys in Germany show that more than 50% of our voters uh, do not support the free market economy. In spite of the socialist economy in Eastern Germany only 20 years ago, so the distortion of wealth and income between the very rich and the very poor and the big gaps in the middle are having uh, their own dynamics. And you are addressing this very shortly, very condensed, because it's not your main issue. But to position climate change in the context of political, local and global governance on the one side and the shortcomings of Western capitalism gives climate change a different dimension for discussion. And it shows that the effects short-termism has in political and also in economic terms, and it ties the things which are interdependent together. This is normally not done, um, uh, because as governments are organized by ministries and the universities are organized by faculties, uh, these cross-sectorial um, recognition and definition is lacking. And this is something which, uh, uh, where you really create a much broader and more important and valuable platform than others uh, have done or have not even tried. So the fact that, that climate change is put into this context will give the discussion on climate change a, a broader dimension in the future because it's tied to those things which are already under question and will, will be like a turbocharger uh, for um, making sure that we are not only taking a long-term view, but that we are taking action under the views of long-term thinking. And it certainly will also encourage a further discussion on uh, revising our democratic uh, party systems. Uh, these two short election periods of four years will come under, under, under criticism again. And also the fact that there are so many parallel uh, election campaigns taking place in our countries and between our countries inside Europe is something which creates a focus on short-term political achievements and the retention of power rather than long-term thinking. So these things have to be adjusted without throwing democracy overboard. Democracy has to be revised. And we know how difficult this is in America. But it will be easier in Europe uh, because the understanding for the shortages of short-term thinking here are, in my mind, in Europe a bit better. Uh, than in other places. Another uh, issue in terms of content are your regional differentiations. We live in a period where Europeans and Americans largely believe what we are having, in spite of it not being perfect, would be the best also for Iran and China. Um, and this political arrogance and cultural arrogance uh, will have to come to an end uh, because of the power shift to the East and those systems having a stronger state, a stronger governance as we have. Uh, less tolerance um, uh, and uh, more community and less individualism. So this direction can be seen already with the shift of power and rather this taking a revolutionary uh, developments, uh, it should be an evolutionary process and your book will contribute to that because it ties this phenomenon together with climate change and the discussion on capitalism also. So um, uh, the, the regional differentiation um, is a, a signal to us in the West that what is fine and good for us is not necessarily as good and as fine for other countries. And we should have a bit more tolerance in our global um, agenda, uh, rather than trying uh, to be uh, uh, active on human development and human rights in China, we have to be open uh, on this and, and put it on the agenda in a formal, practical way 
and not from an ideological, but from a prob from the point of view of of environment, of employment, and of peace. If we uh, reposition this discussion from ideology to practical application, uh, then this differentiation between those countries is much easier to handle and we have a common platform for dialogue. So I do hope that uh, this book is understood by the media and by the intelligent readers uh, that this is a broader agenda than just climate change. So in summary, I must say uh, it's a great achievement. I congratulate you. And it is written in the true sense of the Club of Rome's beliefs and methodologies. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions, comments, thoughts. So why don't we start Claude? And four, then Anders. Then. So Claude, uh, one, two, three. We'll I, ha do a, I have two a or three question comments for and then we'll, we'll come back. I have a question for Jürgen with regard to how he thinks people should understand his book. Because the, f the first uh, Club of Rome book um, was often bad mouthed and abused, I think, for two reasons. One reason was that people didn't like the message because they didn't believe in limits. But secondly, also, because they did not understand that these projections, the modeling, were not predictions or forecasts. And you yourself, Jürgen, you have often said to me that people don't understand, they don't make that distinction. Now, I haven't read the book, and, and Eberhard von Kerf has just alluded to this point, but I would like to hear you because you always use the word forecast now, that, that's a prediction. Whether, in fact, you have gone away from what you believed was an important principle that should be understood in the, f in the first Club of Rome book, 1972. Let's take a couple of questions, Carl, and then we can come back to... to um, Anders, Anders Wickman, you have the floor. Th th thank you, Jürgen. Um, fantastic achievement, I must say. I haven't read the book, so allow me three very quick questions. Um, one is with regard to your first point on population. You make uh, a rather optimistic uh, assumption that population will level out at the level of 8 billion people uh, towards the middle of the century. At the same time, your contention is that the low-income countries will not really take off. Now, to me, that is a little bit a contradiction because fertility rates are particularly high in the poorest countries. Uh, and how you, how you get this equation together, I, I, I simply don't understand. Secondly, uh, climate sensitivity. Um, I wonder to what extent you have taken in the latest research with regard to both slow and, and, and more long-term feedbacks, um, not really relating then to, 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 to the level of greenhouse gas concentration, rather to what's happening when the albedo is changing, when methane is leaking, etc. These seems to me to be, be the real dangerous possible tipping points. And, and <coughs> do you have a comment there? And lastly, you didn't say a word about ecosystems and biodiversity. To me, the pressure on those systems, um, whether we talk about resources or we talk about the diversity in, 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 in the ecosystems is a major, major challenge. And, and even if the economy would grow somewhat slower than what OECD and others predict, uh, I don't get it with, with the kind of organization of the economy we have that, that, that we can sustain these systems. Can we take one question? Well, I was going to ask the gentleman over here. That is handy first, and I'll come back. We'll do three, and then we'll ask you. Yeah, I haven't and I'll come uh, back to you had a chance to read your book, but I glimpsed uh, in it, and I saw that uh, for further reading, you refer also to the book of Paul Gilding, The Great Disruption. Paul has been a couple of times in the Netherlands and attracting great crowds. You start from the same point. You have a similar vision, but Paul Gilding, in his book, is uh, basically saying we will have a great disruption 
So there will be no smooth graphs as you showed, but there will be very steep declines in earlier years with maybe recovery in later years. Could you please tell us what is your view on Paul Gilding's views? Gary, do you have one more question? Why don't you, you ask then? I think four questions is the, the yeah. limits to questions. <laughs> and then we'll ask uh, Jürgen. Well, to thank you, Jürgen. Uh, certainly you've created an, an eagerness to read the book. So my question wouldn't be there per, probably if I had that opportunity first. But uh, Anders said you started with population, but uh, uh, the population itself is linked to economy. What from economy, you have come to your ecological projections, I, is what I understood. What were your basic assumptions about uh, or reasons for the projections on economy which drive the whole rest of the study? OK. Yeah. Carl, do we need the microphone here? No, oh. I, I, I'm oh, you have a microphone. OK, sorry. Uh, Jürgen, here we go. Well, thank you for uh, the comments and for the questions. Uh, I'll uh, have four responses to the comments, we are, which I'll do in the end, and then I'll respond to the questions first. Uh, thank you for the flatter, by the way. That's the starting point. So first, Claude. There, I'm a future scientist, and there are two different types of, of analysis futurists can be making. Either you can make forecasts, where you basically say that the weather tomorrow is going to be sunny, and that the revolution is going to happen in 2020, and that the weather is going to be warmer in 2040. That's a forecast. And a forecast is, has varying qualities. You know, in some systems, you can make forecasts that have a high likelihood of being true. In other areas, like in global forecasting, like the one I'm doing here, the likelihood that your exact forecast is, is correct is somewhat lower. I'll return to that issue, but that's forecasting. Scenario analysis is basically to try to think through the consequences of various ways of action. You know, that, so if we do like this, then this will happen. If we do that, this will happen. Again, the quality thing is the same, that in some systems you can actually make very precise scenarios because the system is predictable. In other uh, areas, like what we're doing here, that is not the case. So that's just in order to define the words. Limits to growth, the 20-year update and the 30-year update were solid scenario analysis. You know, these were analysis. In 1972, we descri described 12 different possible futures of the world, starting with some scenarios that have resource crisis, then pollution crisis, then food crisis, then erosion crisis, etc gradually moving into saner types of futures where you know population control was tried or lower income uh, growth was tried and then finally sustainable policies were put in place in the model system in order to create over 1972 sustainability scenarios and so yes limits to growth was a scenario analysis it showed a number of of, of possible futures, it made the point that from the point of view of the authors, you know, a number of the early, the crisis scenarios, very, very unattractive. And so we thought that society ought to try to put in place the types of policies that shifted the world more likely into the later uh, scenarios. And we stuck to that thing, because this is the only type of thing that you can do, scientifically speaking, you know, and we did so for 30 years. Uh, then we were about to write the 40-year book. And of course, there are no other authors of the 40-year book because the rest of the gang is either dead or didn't think this was a good idea. And so uh, I had then to make the choice. Should we make another scenario analysis or would it actually further the cause better to make an educated guess or to make a forecast which, of course, has huge uncertainties because of the inherent uncertainty of the global system. And so I concluded that it is more interesting now to try to make a forecast. One main reason for that is what I said openly at the beginning. The main audience for this book is me. 
the organ. You know, I have now wasted my time. 40 years I've worried and tried to make the world become a sustainable place. It hasn't had, it has had very little impact. So now I wanted to know what the next 20 years is going to look like. And so I needed a forecast in order to get some peace in my tortured mind. So this is the issue on, uh, it's an important issue, you know, this is a forecast, this is not a scenario analysis. And I will return to the question of what all of you seem to believe is huge uncertainty in the future development of the global system. In one sentence, my view is that you are wrong. There is no big uncertainty in the future of the world, and I'll try to come up with, with the reasons and I'll link it to the elections in, in, in Europe. There are forces, self-correcting forces in, in, in the global system, which act to keep the thing on a fairly predictable path. That's the basic scientific reason for being so arrogant as to at this point in time. We couldn't do this in 1972 because at the time we were young, we didn't know how the world actually operates. We had very little social science competence in, in the group. You know, now, 40 years down the line, having spent one third of life in business, one third of my life in research, and one third of my life as your deputy, you know, in the, uh, in the NGO community, I know very much more about how this sad world actually is, you know, linked together, and consequently, how it is going to evolve. Sorry for such a long answer, but this is, of course, a terribly important uh, uh, question. Anish, uh, it is very important. You know, so there are two central uh, assumptions in the study, and you asked uh, you and, and uh, Gary asked exactly those two. And I'm always trying to highlight them because this is, of course, the basic. This is where future research actually should go in and, and, and further elaborate. It is, so, so uh, on the population side, I'm I believe, I'm not assuming, I believe that fertility, the, you know, the desired completed family size, will fall dramatically not only in the rich world, where it already has fallen to the extent which most people don't seem to be aware, that most rich world countries are, except for the pro-natalist United States of America and my home country of Norway, which are the only two countries in the world, in the rich world, which have serious population growth. All the others are stagnant, and if you disregard the immigration to these countries, you know, these populations are already declining, just like Canada. I gave a talk about these things. I work for the Chinese government on sustainability uh, indicators. So I gave them a preview of this thing in, in Beijing in, in December. And I showed them my, you know, the fact that uh, the Chinese population is going to peak in 2020. First question from the Ministry of Science and Technology after I've given my talk. Where did you get your population numbers from? And I said, well, I'm using, you know, the available international statistics. And I said, the population numbers for China are wrong. And I said, mm, God, no, I'm curious. And I said, in what way? And I said, they're much too high. And I said, how do you know? And they said that we are now in 2011. We're starting to get the first census data for the 2010 census for China. Turns out that, that the growth rate of the Chinese population is even lower than they thought, and the absolute numbers are significantly lower than they thought. So they thought that the, the Chinese population is not going to peak in 2020, it's actually going to peak before 2020. If you look at Japan, Japan has of course been going downhill for, for uh, 15 years. You know, these are flat peaks. Germany is of course also close to the peak. So uh, then you said, but what, uh, so th this explains why uh, when you get rich, you know, it is not what we believed in 1972 that rich affluent families have a lot of children. And this is because of the obvious fact that if women can choose between a job and children, they choose a job. And that's, you know, irrespective of what conservative people think about that, that's what they would like to do. And if you want to liberate the women, you don't get children. And this we see in the rich world, and this is, of course, going to be copied elsewhere. 
we have more than 50% of the population living in urban areas now, so it's urban fertility, which is interesting. It doesn't make one iota sense of anyone to have more children when you live in a crowded 10 million megacity. You know, the fewer children you have, the better. Contraception although being resisted by many, is much more easily available and population has always known how to get the number of children that they actually want to have. So these are many reasons. Yes, if you go into the book, you can of course go and look at the rest of the world, 140 people, uh, 140 poorest countries, and yes, fertility decline is postponed for 10 to 20 years. You know, it goes down, but from at a much higher level. It's just that uh, the rest of the world is big enough to compensate for the, for the had, you know, hadn't the three billion poorest existed, the world's population would have gone down even faster. Let me then take the same central, and this is so central that there is at the end of the book, a full page picture of fertility developments in the EU 15 over the last 50 years in order to highlight a statistical basis for this arrogant uh, conclusion of mine. On the next page is productivity growth in the United States of America from 1950 to 2010, which shows how fast labor productivity in the United States has evolved over this period. And contrary to what anyone I've ever uh, read say, there is a totally clear trend from of the order of plus 4% a year, you know, in productivity growth in 1950, to a number which is 1% or below 1% per year uh, at this point in time. So productivity growth is going down. It means that productivity, you know, is stagnating. If you start thinking about it, it makes endless sense. You know, it's very simple to mechanize agriculture and then you move the people into manufacturing and then you can, of course, uh, increase labor productivity in, in manufacturing and you move the people on to, to services and social care, etc. And now we are in situations in the mature economies where most of the employment is in that end of the spectrum where you cannot very easily increase productivity. And it turns up in the aggregate numbers. And if you, are, uh, you don't like this one, we do have numbers. We use the Penn uh, State uh, tables for this. Unbelievable, you know, how this downward trend in productivity growth is a strong phenomenon. Very interesting. One reason why you may believe that this is wrong is that you're using the wrong definition of labor productivity. I am using GDP divided by the potential workforce, namely everyone between 15 and 65. So it means a society that achieves high productivity growth among those few that work. You know, don't sc score so well on, on, on my score. You know, because what is interesting in my perspective is, you know, how much do the, how, do, how does a nation organize its labor market uh, and its total production? So that's it. Climate science, I think, you know, the uncertainty in our forecasts is so big that that's why I'm saying plus two degrees in 2050. It's, of course, plus two degrees, plus minus two degrees, you know, if you are to, to be very uh, precise about it. There are big uncertainties and, and the news Every now and then the news are worse than the average in prison and every now and then the news is on the other side. Uncertainty is big, but as anecdotal evidence indicates, you know, we are clearly, you know, moving into territory which is not so uh, good. Finally, on the footprint thing, I didn't mention it here because the, you know, bastards that run this thing only gave me 12 minutes. Have a look in the book and you see the, the non-energy footprint graphs and the nature graphs and the whole thing. The very interesting thing is that with my population and GDP forecast, it isn't a problem. You know, it, it will be scarcer than it was before, but in 2050, you're not down into a problem. And you see the simplest example of this is, of course, in how the capitalist world has handled peak oil. You know, yes, conventional oil, you know, ordinary liquid stuff that you get out of the ground by poking a stick in Texas. Yes, but that peaked in 1970. Then, so if since then, conventional 
oil has gone down. Then, of course, one went into shallow offshore, the, the Gulf. And of course, the, if you add conventional oil and shallow, you know, the peak occurred 20 years later. Then you can add on deep water, you know, thing. And now, of course, we're adding in the shale oil and the whole thing. And you see that the oil thing is doing exactly what one would think, you know, a very flat peak and then down uh, into the future, which is all we're going to need because energy efficiency is going to increase over the next 40 years. And so uh, the whole, what I have done, which very few other people have done, is to dot all the eyes. I like this one. I mean, so there is consistency, and the spreadsheets are, of course, available. You can just go on the www.2052.info. There is the whole schmear. I mean, you can go in and change your numbers and, and do the thing uh, the way you want to. 